Hello and welcome to this uh, podcast of uh, movement analysis for the uh, Foundations of Physiotherapy Practice 2 subject PTHY 103. So here are the learning objectives of this lecture and um, hopefully by the end of this lecture you can revise and um, be able to demonstrate an understanding of the use of a framework and that you'll use to observe and describe human movement but also be able to understand that the factors that will influence the performance of the movement and motor tasks that we commonly see, and then be able to uh, determine the presence of a variation for this normal uh, movement using the framework and then identifying errors in that movement, which for us clinically are an important part of what we do. So why, why understand analysis of movement? And I think a lot of us would already probably analyse movement without really thinking about it. But this um, lecture and, and further weeks will provide a systematic method of doing that so that it can be, as we talk about, being objective and valid and reliable and it's a universal way rather than um, using subjective opinions into movement analysis, which often forms still an important part, but having a systematic method will create that universal learning tool. Um, it allows us to conceptualise the, uh, the muscular contributions to a movement and break them down step by step in order to identify their function, but also um, identify the implications it may, this may have on um, potential pathology or um, functional ability in activity participation. So um, remember, bear in mind this is a learning tool. So this is for us to at, at first year level to be able to have a, uh, a learning tool to find a uh, pragmatic way of analysing a, a movement at, at multiple levels rather than really not always representing a real world motion analysis like it would in a biomechanics lab, um, but an effective clinical and, and, and practical tool that we will use. So when we talk about analysis of movement, what does that mean? And I guess this is where we'll, you'll start to learn this table is going to be embedded in your minds in the next few weeks. However, it is to break down the types of things that we want to find out when analysing a movement of any sort. Um, and so the first you can see there's the function. So the function in, um, is, for instance, the squat. And you can see that that's been split up into the down phase and the up phase. And um, fairly straightforward that you need to separate these two um, phases as joints, range of motions, etc. will be very different and important when analysing movement in um, normal and also abnormal movements is to identify in which phases may the injury or the weakness etc. may they be affecting to a greater capacity. Um, so you can see there the next column along is the joints so identifying what joints are involved during that movement and splitting them up into what would be uh, joints involved in both the down and up and how they would change as we go along the, the column here. Um, range of motion, so therefore at the joint, what range of motion is that joint going through, or if it's a snapshot, what joint, uh, what range of motion is the joint in? Um, and then gravity, so is it um, gravity assisted, is it against gravity, is it gravity modified? So those are things that are important when analysing as we then go to think about whether it's an eccentric or concentric contraction, um, or isometric I should say also. So that's a type of contraction and I know with our anatomy program a few of us are still trying to grasp that understanding of whether the contraction is lengthening, shortening or staying uh, as a static contraction. and knowing the application of gravity should assist us in making this decision um, and then that will bring us to well if we think that it's going to be a controlled movement or an eccentric movement then we need to identify the muscles that were producing that contraction um, so particularly in, in order of the prime mover so what's the prime muscle that's responsible for either producing or controlling that range of motion during these uh, these movements in particular for this example in the squat the quadriceps muscles at the knee would be working eccentrically to control the flexion of the knee uh, brought on by gravity and weight of the body. And then your antagonists and stabilizers. So what muscles are having to work? So for instance, if you have a rectus femoris, which would be working eccentrically at the knee, then um, I, what are you going to have to recruit in order to combat this uh, potential unwanted movement at the hip? Or um, are you happy that that's the movement you want? Do you need to stabilize the trunk and the, pel and the pelvis? So things like that are things that you should now starting to be asking yourselves when you're assessing a movement. 
the other the last column here is kind of at other factors or quality so really not limited too much um, you can be pretty open to your subjective nature here so things like your quality so what did the movement look like were you happy that it, that it looked um, in a normal range was there something that stood out so for instance as we go down was a squat was their knee collapsing in were they hitched to one side um, did they kind of weight bear more on one side or sometimes it just looks a bit abnormal to start with and then you need to you know, break it down a little bit to find the, the pure abnormality in that movement so they can all go in these other factors or the quality um, and as you can see the shoulder abduction and press up is also what we'll go through in the following slides So what does activity and function mean? So activity function is, is that, is a function. So it's not uh, shoulder AB duction purely, it's not uh, um, finger extension, it's the it's whole activity being gait or squat, press up um, in a functional kind of movement motor gym type sense or sport sense. But then again, you know, squats is a very functional thing for any person to be able to achieve for activity of daily living. So don't think automatically that they've got a bar on their shoulders and they're performing a perfect heavy weighted squat. Um, it is a very functional movement um, for activities of daily living living um, but then reaching up to a shelf so um, for instance in if you're going to do a, a, an occupy a home visit sorry and then you're seeing someone's activity needs to be able to reach up to the tea jar or to the coffee or a cup of uh, the cups or anything that they need to be able to reach to a shelf and you need to analyze uh, potentially with their pathology or no pathology what this might involve computer works a big one so people's ergonomic setup at their computer their mouse where their mouse is um, how they need to use that what movements or shoulder elbow wrist and, and back and neck would they need to use in order to effectively use the mouse without causing um, any uh, in stress and injury to their upper limb and their neck um, and then eating which is often normally thought as a subconscious movement and that we don't need to think about it but if you have any you know post radial head fracture um, or elbow dislocation then you have stiffness and uh, capsular stiffness or uh, therefore making getting your hand to your mouth to eat can often be difficult and often need to break down well what movements and what ranges do they require what muscles do they require in order for this movement to happen uh, the joint, so the joint is pretty self-explanatory, so the joint, what all the joints involved in the movement must be recorded, so not just in this example with the bicep curl, not just the elbow, um, so you need to consider that the shoulder has a stabilising role here, um, often if they're doing in front of a mirror, like this cat would be all oiled up, would be very, like most people would be doing an elbow curl, would be doing it probably in front of a mirror with a shirt off like that, so you'd need uh, stabilising of the head and neck muscles to keep his head up into the mirror, but in this phase he's looking down purely at the uh, gun region, so you will require some stabilisation of his uh, cervical extensors at the moment. And then obviously the wrist position and fingers in order to maintain the wrist position and the finger position in holding the dumbbell. So don't just forget about, don't just use the primary joint, make sure you're thinking outside the square to ensure everything is being thought of. Um, so range of motion, range of motion was joints to each of the joint. Um, so and obviously in regards to describing it, it's in regards to the movement. So your flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, etc. Um, if there's no motion occurring and if it's a static position or a stabilizing position, you record nil. For instance, in a soccer player down here in the bottom left, um, you need to be identifying um, stance leg versus kicking leg. Um, and then really, as you can see, you probably need to identify from head and neck and shoulder all the way down. So what positions the shoulders in um, left and right, positions the hip in on his kicking leg versus hip in stance leg, um, what positions the knee in kicking leg versus stance leg and ankle and so forth. So that you're being very particular in what you're identifying and that you understand the skill involved in the movement to uh, identify the normal range of motions that may be required um, versus an abnormal range of motions that may be compensations or, or strategies to go away from any restrictions to perform the overall skill um, and then in the middle picture you can see that basically every joint is, is, is in extension and the feet are in plantar flexion so you'd need to put in um, all joints down to find their approximate range of motion and then if you had any stiffness or restriction in one joint of that kinetic chain you would have um, 
you would have kinetic chain effects all the way down so for instance if you lack shoulder uh, flexion range here in that movement then you would have uh, compensation potentially through trying to further extend through the lumbar spine so things like that are examples of um, while this looks like a normal movement that analyzing each joint and each range of motion um, may be able to identify potential compensatory patterns so gravity so um, gravity so gravity against and with eliminated so you're thinking is the movement against gravity? Are you having to produce uh, a movement up towards gravity? Or is it with, so you're going down towards the ground? Or is it eliminated, so you're potentially um, horizontal to gravity, so therefore it's not an effect? Is the type of contraction then um, with gravity, is it concentric? So are you shortening a muscle to produce a, a force? Um, are you eccentrically or are you controlling the movement because gravity is causing a, a, a different movement so you're controlling that eccentric movement or is it isometric are you happy like our ring uh, person on the rings here that he's staying um, isometric in that position so he has to create a force that's equal to the gravity pushing down and obviously the weight of the body so the roles of our muscles are um, other words that are probably causing a few um, nervous trills at the moment through a NAT 102, but um, the role of an agonist and what an agonist means and is the muscle producing the force the prime mover? Um, and you need to note all muscles that may be prime movers, but obviously there is a prime mover um, is the predominant one. And then you'll have an antagonist, which is an opposite in action. It's not eccentric, it's an antagonist, meaning it's relaxing. A synergist, so a synergist will assist movement and prevent unwanted movements. And then a stabiliser, um, often isometric, so it'll be trying to um, stabilise the joint or either you know compress a joint for stability, um, or and or stop shear forces. Um, and then often it's proximal, so it's close to the joint surface rather than far away, which we can understand with some of our vectors that we have been going over in the last six weeks. Um, what are some other factors? So other factors that may limit the movement um, are things that we come into play and why we do need to look at movement analysis from a normal perspective before we can start to identify abnormal and then identify the impairment that may be producing the abnormal movement. So things like muscle tightness or preferably muscle length um, may be limiting the movement which might also be capsular changes so with intraarticular through joint or capsule changes may be also related to tightness so don't just think tightness is in tight muscles I'd like you to think a little bit further in um, applying length or and or intracapsular changes um, muscle weakness so muscle weakness can come on through um, disuse or um, overuse particularly pain swelling um, or compensatory patterns for other reasons can also happen if you have tightness of shoulder then or a joint sorry then you may have weakness of muscles due to the restriction in range of motion so they're all things to consider about um, postural changes so this may be whether it's um, kind of structural changes through um, curvatures of spines or potentially um, abnormalities or congenital abnormalities that change joint position um, and then we have swelling so swelling will often cause in inhibition um, but also joint restriction so um, you'll have the inhibition so brain will often turn off muscles in response to swelling and and or pain but also the swelling will cause a, a joint restriction to particularly end of range which will if you're doing end of range move or movements that require end of range joint range of motion then um, potentially that may be there due to swelling within the anterior region uh, pain, so pain again on the same inhibition is that you will have inhibition of muscles, uh, your brain will protect that area due to pain signals, so therefore not uh, you know, compensating through uh, different joints or through potentially non-weight bearing etc may be ways that you will try to avoid pain um, and find ways around things. Our bodies are very good at finding different ways to avoid painful stimulus and um, they can become habits that may be one year post-injury without pain may still be present. 
Uh, muscle spasm. So muscle spasm tends to come in a little bit to do with pain as well, and that pain um, may may cause muscle spasm and guarding. So often uh, interchangeable. That if you have pain, there will be an associated muscle spasm sometimes. Um, sometimes unusual to see any spasm without the presence of pain or swelling, but definitely can still happen. And uh, potentially with some of the neurological conditions, you'll have muscle spasm and contracture as a result of those. Um, so things to think about when you're looking at movement analysis. So movement phases, and, and this is where um, the, your complex mind starts to come in. You need to be making sure that you may need to split the entire movement into sub-movements because uh, we know that different movements will require different muscles, different energies, uh, different kinetic chain principles, so breaking them up into separate positions. So for example, we have our, uh, our throw, so you have your wind-up phase, which is going to be a different, um, uh, a different set of ra joint range of motions and muscle actions than the cocking phase. And then we should know from our NAT 102 exam the acceleration of the throw is going to be different to the deceleration of the throw and very important to split these up rather than um, throw put throwing in as one movement um, as it's a variety of, of different joint range of motions different muscle actions and different controlling actions so there was a uh, video throw showing an effective throw um, potentially the showing that the output or the outcome may not represent the performance. Um, so many of the guys and, and even girls out there that may throw like our examples um, is gives you an idea of how to uh, see an abnormal action, particularly in non-pathological people. Um, so bearing in mind uh, they were people throwing with their wrong arm. Um, hopefully that was their wrong arm. Um, so you can see the changes uh, in the kinetic chain as well as the uh, often molding of those phases presented earlier rather than the nice uh, split up into the four phases so um, a little bit of a laugh there in regards to analyzing movement um, so examples of what we're what we will be uh, looking at and analyzing in the following weeks and an example in this lecture is the squat uh, the shoulder abduction the press up or kicking a soccer ball so in a squat, if we're looking at anterior view, you could see the person, uh, the picture on the left there, you're looking at the uh, symmetry of the feet um, in alignment of the toes, the knee and the hip, the, the alignment and the level of the pelvis, um, the centering of the, the abdomen and the sternum over the, the midline of the pelvis or the pubic symphysis. Um, with the hands out, you're looking at shoulder height as well. You're looking at weight bearing, that is, the, uh, is there equal weight bearing from left to right? Um, is the angle of this left leg equal to that of the right? And you can probably see that the left uh, looks like this patient is looking is weight bearing a little bit more on the right side as the left's a little bit more out on this angle here. If you were to look at some of the angles down in the middle of the, uh, of the uh, person here in comparison to the line of the leg. In the picture on the right, you can see an exaggeration of what we describe as genu valgus, which is this uh, hip AD duction, um, but this valgus at the knee here. Um, and then the change in the foot from the left than it is on the right um, into plantar flexion, as well as potentially a little bit of inversion. Um, the shift in weight pelvis now, you can see a little bit of a different alignment from the left um, ASIS across onto the right and that's resulted uh, due to the shift change in what's happened at the knee joint. And then looking again at the trunk and is the trunk now probably shifted a little bit more to the patient's right than in the photo on the right. So there are some examples of the quality of movement that you're looking for but need to when analysing break down each joint, each range of motion and muscle, gravity and type of contraction um, and then looking at the quality. So these are qualities that you probably already pick up now without having done this course before but now we're starting to get it to a deeper level of potentially why this might be happening. So in the lateral, lateral view, things to look for uh, in position on the left, you can we see in a normal, what we uh, advocate as being a normal position is um, feet are flat on the floor, weight bearing a majority through the, through the posterior third of the foot, so towards the heel, uh, nice straight back or uh, decreased lumbar lordosis, um, and hips uh, behind the knees here, so the knees are in line with the midfoot and not over the toes here. Um, 
trunk nice and tall, shoulders in line with head on neck, which we can't see. Then in the picture on the right, you can see this uh, loss of lumbar, lumbar neutral, so a, a lumbar lordosis, um, which has resulted in a uh, lean forward posture and position, which has resulted in a knee uh, anterior knee position over the big toe now, and so an increased ankle dorsiflexion range. So that you can see that if someone has a, uh, a sore lower back and doesn't like getting into extension, that this is often a compensatory strategy that the knees will come forward and take the lower and often um, increase forces through the patellofemoral joint will result and vice versa if someone um, is lacking dorsiflexion range um, they will often they can't get into this position so they will change through their knee joint in shoulder abduction and a, a, a shoulder lateral raise is you can see the the picture on the right of your on the left of the screen sorry is in a neutral position of glenohumeral in the head of the humerus in line with the with the chest and the particular the scapula um, and although it's not super clear you can't see any changes through the trapezius muscles or the upper neck muscles but the position uh, the picture on the right hand of the screen shows this hitching or this uh, this raising of the whole shoulder girdle rather than on the left you can on the left you can see the clear glenohumeral rhythm and, and in separation rather than this whole kind of shoulder girdle hitching movement and you can see some trunk lateral flexion here on the left side uh, in order to hitch that movement up and that's often with a weakness of uh, shoulder adductor muscles or potentially rotator cuff unable to stabilize correctly um, during the, the lift of abduction. Um, so reassessing client performance, so um, definitely when you do movement analysis is potentially to uh, analyse the first time, then intervene and then analyse again and you're wanting to see changes, so movement analysis is a nice way to record changes, hence the universal uh, systematic approach to being able to analyse movement as a whole so that uh, as physiotherapists we are able to correctly and um, and use a reliable measure of being able to analyse movement for um, a baseline assessment as well as effectiveness of intervention. So the press up, so this is what we will do in, in future classes as well as at home is analysing the movements of the um, up phase or the down phase, sorry, towards the press up and then the reverse phase of the up. So you're looking everything from, so people that may have ankle issues find that getting into dorsiflexion might be uncomfortable, so you may find compensatory changes up the chain, but you can see the differences of what you're trying to achieve in the down phase or the bottom of the down phase versus up at the top. Um, trying to identify particularly this lumbar lordosis, the thoracic kyphosis, what position the neck is in and the shoulder girdle etc. So you are using this uh, movement analysis table in order to uh, correctly analyse uh, the kinetic chain principle um, as it may be a little bit of hunting needed to, while they may have shoulder pain, it may be depending on whether they could even have big toe issues. So you're thinking along the chain as is this all in the range of motion and movement that you would expect. Similar with a soccer ball is um, kicking a soccer ball is a commonly used movement for biomechanics as well as in sports physiotherapy um, to be able to uh, identify what style of kicking a player will use, um, their dominant leg versus non-dominant leg, how their movement analysis may change, particularly at uh, elite level they will need to be equally effective on both sides and often if they haven't been coached a lot that they will have small inefficiencies on their non-dominant leg that will go unnoticed unless you uh, potentially presents as, as an injury. So uh, making sure that you uh, assess both sides, you have a look from the big toe all the way up to the trunk and the shoulder, because um, as we know, if you have a, potentially a shoulder issue, a shoulder impingement, and not wanting to lift the arm up, it may change trunk rotation, which may uh, change pelvic rotation, which may change length of quadriceps and power of quadriceps particularly to produce uh, and hip flexors to produce the kick powerfully. So hopefully that
um, has given you an understanding of why we would do movement analysis, how we would do movement analysis, and then in the following on shoots that we will look at is applying the tables of two certain movements and being able to identify what might be normal and then have a practice at seeing, well, potentially how would I identify abnormal and then furthermore, how would I break down what would be causing abnormal. So in summary, hopefully this podcast has led you towards uh, having a systematic approach to movement analysis, um, focusing on one joint at a time and one part of the movement. Um, and then once you've focused on one, you can move on above and below, um, identifying the prime movers, know their action, know their type of contraction, know the quality involved in that. The limitations, so what would limit a person's movement and potentially when you're assessing is there anything that you could identify would be uh, causing a limitation to that movement um, and is it something you are happy that is a limitation or is it something you need to control? Um, the quality of movement, what was the overall quality of movement of that, uh, and of that movement and uh, are you can you see or can you find the impairment potentially that would be causing the the poor quality of movement or if it's good quality of movement, what are the attributes that that patient or that person would have to produce that high or quality movement. And then most importantly, why we do this is analysis for us to make our assist with our diagnosis, but more importantly, create an intervention plan, an effective intervention plan once we have worked out the impairment level because the thing to think about with all of this is that patients will come to us um, often with an issue they will come to us saying they are having pain kicking they are having problems getting the teapot um, out of the top shelf they are having problems getting out of bed so we need to be not only thinking about joint at a single level but making sure we're putting it as part of the movement um, and identifying that impairment that may be a bit of a chink in the chain so um, I think in terms of putting this all together this is a vital vital skill for physiotherapists of all um, types and all areas to ensure we are skilled at um, and you probably find you might already be looking at movements and trying to analyze them already um, from your certain background so things to start building on and then more importantly to feedback to patient and, and the age of technology videos and, and assessment are fantastic feedback tools to give to patients to show them what you're talking about because often they can't see the uh, in, in, the inefficiencies in their movement or their poor mechanics or their poor quality of movement so often feedback regarding photos or videos and and one-on-one uh, -on -one time feedback can be very helpful for them to identify but also then to uh, see the effectiveness of their intervention and they can see the changes and they are able to work on them um, due to the changes that you have shown.